Baruch Hashem Yehowah. Blessed be the name of Yehowah. Toda Baba Yah for another Shabbat day. Toda Baba for keeping us alive. For your mercy endures forever and ever. And I ask that you may please forgive us for our sins, our transgressions, and our iniquity. And please give us the strength to forgive those who have sinned against us. And I ask that you may put joy in our heart on this yom, on this day. And I ask that we may put away the cares of the world, any issues that we may have in our personal life, whether it be financial issues, or whether it be any dysfunction with people, or whether it be any heartaches. I ask that you may put joy in our heart. And I ask that you may please remember those who may be mourning the loss of a loved one. I ask that you may heal them in due season. And I ask that the sorrow will not last forever. But I ask that in due season, that you may put joy in their heart. You may give them understanding, give them comfort, give them shalom. I will please remember the dog of Koti Bolin, give her shalom, give her comfort. And I ask that you may heal her in due season, give her strength. But you are helping in the time of trouble. And I ask that you may please remember Adonis our Yahoo and his mission. Please give them shalom and see his morning the loss of blood. And I ask that those who are mourning, that you may strengthen them with your word, with your power, with your ruach. And I also ask that you may please remember those who may be sick on this call and those who are not on this call that may be sick. But I ask that you may heal their body, touch their flesh, make them whole in due season. And I ask that you may keep us far from all forms of evil. And I ask that we would not be confounded or seduced by the ways of this world. But I ask that you may put your word within us, cause us to walk in all your statutes. And I ask that you may give us an upright heart and ask that we can always be thankful for the things that we have. And I ask that we would not murmur and complain and be angry with you for the things that we do not have. For Tehillim, for Psalms 123 reads, Yahweh is my shepherd. I do not lack. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He turns my my back, my beam. He turns back my beam. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. When I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rotting and staff take comfort. You spread before me a table in the face of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Only goodness and loving commitment follow me. All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh to the length of days. The Leo Yah, I ask that you may open up our hearts as we go into this lesson. And I ask that you may give us understanding, give us insight. And I ask that we may all direct our hearts towards you, for you are most set apart. And there is no sin within you. Let your will be done, and may in the main, so be it. Hello, yeah. Hello, yeah. Amen. Well, I mean, told out, told out Rabbi uh, Adon for, for, the, for the prayer. Um, Shabbat Shalom, Mishpaka. Shabbat Shalom. Um, like we said last Shabbat, uh, this, this segment uh, today of the language and the culture, we're going to try and um, address any questions or um, comments that you, you might have and really concerning. Um, the language, the culture, and then um, any lessons uh, myself or, or Adon Kanakia or Maurice Mock um, went into that you might have a couple of questions about or you want to make a comment about. Um, and, and I just want to put a couple of rules out, some uh, light rules out that remember this is the Shabbat day. So, so remember that in your questions. And also, um, to try and address everybody's questions, we might just scratch the surface uh, to guide you in the in the direction that might further answer your questions, if we can. Now, I'm, I'm not saying we know everything. <laughs> Matter of fact, we we don't know everything, but we can try and edify what we um, what we've we've already went into um, as far as lessons and 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 things of that nature, the culture, the language. Uh, things of that nature. 
So um, keep that in mind as, as we open the floor for any questions or comments and, and um, try to make your questions very pointed to the point um, uh, with clarity. And then uh, if you have comments, keep the comments. Um, remember that there's other people that might have a comment or question. So keep your comments kind of straight to the point. All right, Mr. Uh the floor is open. The floor is open. Uh, just raise your hand and, and we'll try and address any questions. Uh, Maurice, Mark, you got any guidance before we open? No, that was to the point. It's okay, that was to the point. Okay, okay. All right, the floor is open, Mr. Picard. The floor is open. May the most high uh, bless us with the Ruach so we can get a, a an understanding, uh, an understanding of, of his set apart word. Hello, yeah. Shabbat Shalom, Akoti Imana. The floor is yours. Shabbat Shalom, Mishpaka. Um, all praise is honor and esteem to the Most High. I want to acknowledge my ish as my covering. Um, I posed the question on the group chat last night. I'm not sure if you guys saw it. It was uh, um, as far as the fasting. I was told before that we're not supposed to fast on Shabbat. So if I'm doing a long-term fast, should I skip Shabbat or is it okay to fast on Shabbat for that purpose? Are you? King, King. Uh, yes, I, I I saw your question as we were closing out uh, last night on the um, on the um, uh, Shabbat study last night. I saw the question, and um, I, I get, I'll try and address it first. I'll try and address it first, um, and I'll, I'll I'll go this way. If if we look at uh, matter of fact, let me just share screen real quick. Maybe that'll help. All right, so if, if we go to um, Shemot or Exodus chapter 16, um, verse 23, right? And it says, and he said unto them, this is that which Yah hath said, tomorrow is the rest of the holy Shabbat unto, the, unto Yah. Bake that which ye will bake today and see that ye will see and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morrow, until the morning. And they laid up till the morning as Moshe bade, and it did not stink. Neither was there any worm therein. And Moshe said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath, a Shabbat, unto Yah. Today ye shall not find it in the field. All right. So the reason why I went there first is uh there is commandment in that there is commandment in that right and 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 we know what shabbat is right we we we've, we've gone over shabbat uh the set apart um um rest of yahweh of of yah right um and and the intent of the shabbat we did a we did a, a series on that um we got vi the videos are, are on the on the uh youtube channel about the Shabbat. We went into the Shabbat very thoroughly, right? And the Shabbat is supposed to be um, worry-free, stress-free, um, rest, reflection, uh, and reverence to the Most High, right? To the Most High. That That's really the, the, the intent of a Shabbat, a Sabbath, <laughs> right? And so um, if we go into, um, we look at that same chapter down to 25, um, it's not that we can eat on the Shabbat, you know, the, this Shabbat is the Shabbat of the most high. It is a set apart Shabbat, set apart from all the other Shabbat, like the Shabbatones of the, of the feast days, the Moeds, right? It's, it, it, this one is, is different. This one is, is, is set apart, uh, as Yah's, uh, Shabbat, Right. And then we know that the the, the moeds, the um the, the Shabbatones on the moeds gives us certain concessions that are different than the most high Shabbat, right? And so um the answer um that I will give is um you're not supposed to 
afflict yourself on the most high set apart uh, rest day, which is the Shabbat. It's supposed to be stress-free, worry-free, uh, rejuvenation, revital, you know, it's to revive you, to give you a reprieve from all the stresses that you go through through the six days prior to it. Uh, that's my answer in a nutshell. Jane Tudor. Does that help? Kane's I can Tudor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> now, can you fast on the Shabbat? Yeah, it's possible. But your 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 question, I think, was should we fast on Shabbat? Um, and I'll go a little bit further and say that a fast is supposed to be an affliction, right? We're supposed to afflict our bodies. We're supposed to make ourselves lowly. We're supposed to, um, you know, really humble our bodies, our our um uh, fleshly inclinations all right uh adon uziel shabbat shalom floor is yours king shabbat shalom uh Sakeen. shabbat shalom mishpaka um i had a question concerning uh the midbar chapter 19 i'm in uh studying this and i was wondering um what is the water of separation uh, when they're talking about the priests and, you know, um, if any priest or person enters the tent of somebody dead being defiled, what what is considered the water of separation? Hallelujah. 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 Um, uh, Maurice, might you want to tackle this one uh, first? <laughs> I think he dropped out. Is okay. Okay. Uh, well, I, I'll I'll go with I'll 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 try and answer it this way. And and remember what I said: study to show thyself approved. Right. We we know that there is a, um, you know, the red heifer and then the water with the hyssop and all of that. It's supposed to be the 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 purification for uh, defilement of a dead body, right? Um, but specifically, the water of separation. Um, I think I'm gonna have to look a little bit deeper into into that to give you a a more uh, direct answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to write that one down, Adon. I don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna kind of lead into any type of uh, misdirection. So um, I, I know in that section what you're talking about. It's talking about how to um, cleanse uh, the defilement of of the dead body with the uh, with the ashes of the red heifer and and the hyssop and, and the water that's outside of the camp. Um, but any further than that, that's a good question. Any further than that, I, I, I'd have to, I'd have to come back to that question. Silica. King is our king. Uh, Torah Rabbi. Um, I thought it was the same thing. I thought it was pretty much like water, uh, probably fetched from like a river, uh, clean water outside of the camp. And it was, you know, brought to the camp and the priest sprinkled it. Um, on all those who were in the vicinity of the dead body. That's that's what my understanding was, but I, you know, I just wanted to get some insight and some edification. But hallelujah, Torah Rabbi. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Um, let me stop sharing real quick so I can see the... All right. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, Imam Shoshana, the floor is yours. Shabbat Shalom, all praises to Yahuwah. 
Hallelujah. For this day of rest. Shabbat Shalom, Ms. Bacab. I'm landing back on um, Imanah's, uh, Koki Imanah's question about the, uh, the fasting on the Shabbat. Uh, I wanted to bring the surface, the, when Moshe was up in the mountain for 40 days and then Yahusha himself fasted for the 40 days. Are those, uh, we know the Father called them to that because the Father called Moshe up to the mountain and and sent Yahusha into the wilderness. So that was a Pacific fast. This is how does that work? With fasting on the Shabbat. I, th I think you I think you you um you you answered it in your I in your answered question. it because it was signed by the Father. Okay. <laughs> right. I think you that, answered that. it in the question. This was uh specifically um uh this was, was specific to uh uh those individuals. But I think in general, just for the general weekly Shabbat for Yisrael, it's not supposed to be a type of affliction. It's not supposed to be a time for uh, affliction and, and stress. Um, but, but like you said, when, when, when the Most High is called or they, or uh, yeah, I'll leave it like that, that, that that's, that's kind of like, um, what do you call it, in a specific case, but in general, in general, um, I think the scriptures are clear that 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 when we that fasting uh, and affliction um, is not the uh, kind of idea of of the weekly Shabbat, the Most High Shabbat. Okay. Uh, Bati Bat Zion, Shabbat Shalom, floor George. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. May I be heard? Okay. Okay. Um, before I speak, I want to give all praise, honor, and esteem to the Most High Yah, for He is worthy. And I would like to acknowledge my Ish as my head covering. Um, my question is more um, culture based. So, and I apologize for the kids in the back. Um, we haven't settled them down yet. Um, the, we, right now, what I'm noticing as I'm reading the scriptures, I'm also reading about the history of, and the culture of the, our ancient neighbors. So like, um, Sumerians, Akkadians, uh, Babylonians, Mesopotamians, um, in general, uh, but I'm like tiptoeing because I'm, I, I know the, the, the law says not to um, not to follow the ways of the heathens um, and to not learn of their ways. But um, I guess my question, try to get to the point, is how do we get an idea of um, our culture and practice? I know here in America. Um, we have, we see our culture and it's vastly different from the way our ancient forefathers were, but how can we see, um, how can we picture it? Um, I don't know how to explain it. Like, of course, first scripturally, but then also historically, like, where do we look? Okay. King, uh, I think that's a good question, and and um, I'm I'm gonna try and answer it this way: that um, us, this generation, the us that has been in this period of captivity, right? Not in our land, not really uh, practicing our culture, um, cut off from our culture for so long. Um, what we have to picture our culture is Torah, you know, and, and we got to start to me, I think we, we got to start to um, remember that, that everything that we need to know how to live a Yisraelite life, how to live a Torah life, how to live a set apart life and what that looks like is Torah. We, 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 we can't approach it from, well, we got to start to, to uh, recognize the difference between 
the way we, the culture we grew up in and the culture that Torah is telling us to, to walk in. That it's, it, it, there is no blending. There is no blending of, of um, the other nation's cultures with the Israel culture. And, and, and I guess what I'm trying to say is we can't approach it from a Greco-Roman type mentality to see the fullness of a set apart culture, which is Torah. If, if, if I have a question on how to raise my children, I go to Torah. I don't go to uh, a PhD psychologist that is uh, American culture, culturized culturalized. I go to Torah. If I want to know how to Chabad my 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 Ima and my uh Abba, I don't go to uh Encyclopedia Britannica, I go to Torah. Right? If I want to know what what foods are for me, for my culture, I, I don't look at at uh the nutrition chart of America. I look at Torah, and I think that's where you will start to see the picture. You'll start to see the difference between cultures. You'll start to see the difference between cultures, right? We, we You have to delve into Torah. You have to become Torah. And then everything you look at, everything you experience, even in this captivity, will be from a Torah lens, and I think it'll be a whole lot easier to see the differences in the culture when we start to approach Torah and our culture in that way. I hope that answers. Kane, um, it, it answers, uh, I guess, the core. Um, but maybe uh, if I can be a little bit more specific of my question. Um, I, I understand that Torah is the instruction for how to live um, and that we must reference Torah um, for all decisions um, of our actions and our livelihood. Um, however, I guess I'm uh, <laughs> looking at it as in a more superficial way, like, you know, how like we know uh, that uh, we are supposed to look a certain way um, and and certain actions that we do uh, for instance i believe like when someone comes are you coming in peace um, washing the feet like for instance when abraham was um, receiving the malachim that was going to pronounce judgment on um, sodom and amora or sodom and amora there was a certain um you know they fed and washed the feet. So those kinds of uh, cultural, uh, I, I would say superficial, but like um, actions, like, uh, yeah, I guess that's the question. And But I think I understand what you're saying in the sense that uh, as long as we're doing what Torah commands us to do, then we are in that culture. And the rest of the things uh, are not are superficial, right? Okay, and I think I understand your question. And and I, like your 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 phraseology is 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 key. You know, like we're supposed to, we're supposed to, we're supposed to. If we grew up in this culture, if we was raised in this culture, and this culture is the only culture we know it wouldn't be a question of supposed to. It, it would just be either we are or we aren't. <laughs> you know, we are or we aren't. Um, it's, it's, we don't go around saying we're supposed to stop at a stop sign. It's either we stop at a stop sign or we, do, or we don't stop at a stop sign. You know, and, and that's the same kind of mentality um, when you are, are immersed in your culture. You know, it's not that we're supposed to look set apart or we're supposed to eat set apart. It's either we are, <laughs> that's the way I grew up. I'm either going to rebel from that or I'm going to comply with that. Um, it's not that I'm supposed to or that I'm commanded to. That's just the lifestyle. A lot of things like we do here in the American culture, we don't 
we don't think about it. Like we, we just do it because that's the way, that's the culture we were brought up in. And I'm saying it, if, if we, and that's, that's a big, that's a hard uh, kind of transition for us that has been cut off from that culture for so long and immersed in this culture for so long to, to kind of uh, separate the, the cultural thoughts, <laughs> to separate the cultural thoughts. We look at Torah from a Roman Greco mindset, you know, and that is a hurdle. And that, and I believe that's what the Most High wants us to learn, to differentiate uh, the the culture that we kind of envy is what kind of got us in trouble to begin with, compared to the culture that He gave us, you know. And and I think uh, if we look at it from um, that perspective, that we are we're trying to shed off this Greco Roman thought of culture and reconnect with the Hebraic Israelite Torah culture. And that, that is not an easy transition. I hope that I hope that helps. Kane, Toda. Hello yeah. Hello yeah. Um Zakane Eliyahu, Shabbat Shalom, four yours. So much time. Right. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Um it's like, hey, you, you're you're firing off on all cylinders here. Hello, so yeah. Whole thing. Um, if I may uh, underscore, uh, as we look at this culture <clears throat> that we've been brought up in, there are things that are clear. I mean, it's like night and day clear that we should have no parts of. Um, I would say also with in our culture, uh, there is subculture, meaning each tribe had something that was specific to it. Um, maybe it had something to do with um, uh, the weaving of certain colors uh, on their garment, um, placed a certain location a certain uh, color of head wrap, perhaps, or, or something of that nature. Uh, but we each, as a subgroup within uh, Yahuwah's culture, had a, a culture as well. So, uh, you know, Abba is, is uh, stating it very clearly that it's a very, very difficult thing to break that mindset and that transition and i would uh first of all go to that which is common and meaning when we read torah there are so many things that are common sense and as Morey uh, <laughs> uh would always say mm -hmm. uh, common sense for the nonsense uh there are so many things that are common sense that would make for life uh, a lot better, a lot easier. So gravitating towards those things is a great step in the right direction as we find our way back. And as your Abba indicated, we have Torah as our basis for everything that uh, we have need of uh, to properly exist and to be and remain set apart. And I like the way that he put it, is not something that we think about doing, it's just something that we do because that's what we are and who we are. Uh, but we are having to differentiate because of this uh, Romanized uh, Babylonian system uh, that we've grown up in, uh, it, it's, it's difficult. And that's that's the uh, the nut that has to be fractured and and cracked into uh, many pieces and and finally swept away. But it's an ongoing process. And as we get to a point where we hit a wall, that's where uh, really a deep dive into scripture and perhaps even with uh, a great deal of um, meditation and prayer 
along with fasting uh, to get directive as to how we move from this point forward uh, surely will be implemented at the appointed time when needed. Ayuk. Hey, Toda, Toda, uh, Rabat, Zakein, um, uh, very good points uh, to kind of put in your toolbox, <laughs> to put in your toolbox. Uh, and, and like you said, uh, um, prayer, fasting, um, rehearsing the, 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 the acts, and, and I would add in there too, just like kind of like what we're doing today when we when we fellowship and we sit around and we talk, we bring these things out and we kind of we kind of uh, um, tug a war with them, you know, so we can try and get um, a, a, a deeper understanding of who we are and whose we are and why the most high set us apart. And I just want to kind of tie up that 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 question uh, that Bazion, uh posed with. Um, you know, when I say it's hard to kind of, uh, we look at Torah, we look at Israelite culture from a Roman Greco perspective. And I use this example before where, where we're saying, you know, like we say, good morning, and we say, Boker Tov, right? Those are Hebrew words, but that, that wasn't a practice in our culture. We, uh, nowhere in scripture did I find anywhere where, where we say Boker Tov to one another as a greeting, you know? Um, and so we kind of, we kind of, from a from a a, a Greco Roman cultural perspective, where we normally greet each other in the morning with "Good morning," we've just taken Hebrew words and and have fashioned those Hebrew words to a Greco Roman culture. That's a that's a cultural thing in America to say "Good morning" to greet somebody for the first time in the morning is to say "Good morning." And what we've done is we've taken a Hebrew, taken Hebrew words and fashioned them to that culture where, where we say Shalom or Shalom Aleicha or Shalom Aleichem. You know, that was our normal greeting. If we were bidding peace, if we were bidding peace, it's more of a, a prayer of blessing than really a greeting, believe it or not. <laughs> so I just want to kind of put it that way as far as, as, as recognizing the cultural differences and recognizing the Israelite culture from the other nation's cultures. And then and, and, uh, we'll move on. Um, Shabbat Shalom of Koti Shakira, the floor is yours. Shabbat Shalom, Mishpaka, Shabbat Shalom. I want to give all honor, all praise, and all esteem to the Messiah. I have a question, and I have been... Um, kind of debating on it. Um, I, I believe I've asked this before, but I want to kind of run it back again. Um, um, I, I know what it says in the scripture that you should not mix wool and linen. So my question is, is that for all fra fabrics that you should not mix are just particularly wool and linen together? Can can throw that for the question. Um, um, not to get into all the breakdown, but what it's talking about is blending um, plant-based fibers with animal-based fibers into the same fabric. That that's that's basically what it's saying. Don't mix a plant-based um, fabric like uh, uh, hemp or cotton. Um, don't mix that with that of animal-based fiber, such as wool, um, uh, you know, and, and like I think it said like beaver uh, fur and stuff like that. What it's saying is, is that should not touch your skin. If it's mixed like that, it shouldn't touch your skin. That's, that's what it says emphatically, right? But, but, uh, but when we look at the Hebrew of that, it's not just talking about... Um, um, it's really talking about mixing plant-based fab, plant-based fibers with animal-based fibers into the same piece of fabric. I hope that answers. Um, um, hello, yeah. Thank you. All right, I see a lot of hands up. Um, how much time we got? All right, got about uh, two or three more. Um, 
And I, I'm, I'm going to go to Zakin Eliyahu. I think he, he's, he's got something to add to that. <laughs> yes, sir, I do. Um, <clears throat> understand who it was that gave us this directive and why. And he knows more about it. Um, and science is finally catching up. Um, Plant-based as well as animal-based clothing as such gives off a particular frequency like cotton gives off uh, a frequency of 100 uh, flax or linen gives off a frequency I think I remember uh, of 5,000 um, wool gives off a frequency of <clears throat> I think it's uh, 100 or, or better when you mix any of them together, it cancels the frequency. Now, why do I mention frequency? We, as uh, humans, we have electrical uh, frequencies within our bodies and about our bodies. And those frequencies help our bodies function and actually insulate us from a lot of things that are viral uh, in the way of diseases and all of this kinds of things. Uh, but when we have this mixed seed or mixed linen or mixed fibers on our bodies, it takes it down so low as to open the door, the threshold to our bodies being impacted by whatever is out there floating about. The priests actually wore linen. Think about that. The priests wore linen, special clothing when they went uh, before Yahuwah. And the more I study this out, there is reason for it. Um, so I'll just encapsulate it in saying Yahuwah knew why it was that he instructed his people to not do such things and it's to our betterment and it works synergistically with the way that our bodies function and are constructed in terms of uh, holding at bay or warding off and uh, you know things that others who are doing such things would be more susceptible to i yield and to uh to uh for that information zakin um, and, and, and like I said, um, when you go back and these types of questions and answers really, um, it's, it's supposed to either conf confirm or solidify what you understand or cause you to scratch your head and say, I need to look into this a whole lot deeper, you know? And so that's, that's a lot of, uh, good information, um, Zakain, and, and, and I would encourage, um, if, if, if you're really concerned about the mixing of the fabrics, um, to really dig into that, you know, uh, like he said, the most high, no, the most high created us. So he knows what's, what's best for our bodies, uh, what's best for our bodies, you know, and, and, and like I said, we, 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 if we, if we look at Torah, try to look at Torah from a Hebraic perspective, um, I think we get a, a, a better understanding of what Yisrael is supposed to uh, look like. That includes uh, what we put on our bodies and in our bodies. So Toda, Toda, uh, Zakim, for, for that input. Um, Koti Talia, Shabbat Shalom, floor is yours. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, I have a question. Um, um, for the past month, um, Maurice Smith was teaching about spiritual warfare. And I remember I asked, say, who bring the punishment on us? Or if the adversary always punished us for spiritual warfare, and he was like, no, Yahuwah too, he put the punish on us sometime when we go to our warfare. And I was asking this, um, chastisement, is it a form of punishment? And for the chastise, when he reprove us, is for our ignorant sin that we sin ignorantly, or sin we sin knowingly and each other bring us back in line. 
Okay, Toda, Toda for for that question, uh, Koti. Um, Maurice, Mark, do you, you want to um, address that question? Uh, shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Mr. Rikash, Shabbat Shalom. Um, Toda Zakain, uh, uh, we're both of you Zakain for uh, taking this segment on. Um, so uh, chastisement, um, when you read into Torah, there's going to be sins of ignorance and sins of presumptuous sins. And most I says he winks at us in our ignorance. There is still a form of punishment for um, for sins of ignorance. You still have a punishment that comes with it or, or a chastisement that comes with sins of ignorance. And while you're in the sense of ignorance, that's why um, when I was going into the spiritual warfare lesson, I was saying, do we know when it's actually the adversary or the most high that is doing something to us? And we coined the term spiritual warfare, which is not actually a term that's actually in the scripture. But anytime people is going through things, they think they're fighting spiritually or why is this going on in my life? They they label it spiritual warfare. So Chaz Tobias of the Most High is not necessarily spiritual warfare, but the way we as individuals define what we're going through as spiritual warfare. That is uh, my reason for stating it that way was so we can identify when we're actually going through spiritual warfare just against the adversary trying to trick us, or if we're actually going through punishments of the most high, and though we're fasting and praying and feeling like things are not going our way sometimes, and we're going through spiritual warfare to get the understanding of the why. So um, chastisement is going to come, and that is that is judgment from the most high. That is a correction from the most high, and it can come on us in, in, in sins of ignorance as well as presumptuous sins. So it's, a, it's an attention grabber, an attention getter. So whenever you're going through your chastisement, it is a corrective action that the Most High puts in place. And so the goal that I was trying to do when I was referencing, are we going through spiritual warfare against the adversary or against the Most High? Because instead of turning on the Most High, like a lot of people do when they're going through their scenarios of what they feel to be their spiritual warfare, some people turn away from the Most High because they feel like he's not with them because they don't understand that it's chastisement. So therefore their chastisement has them thinking that they're going through spiritual warfare. So chastisement comes on all levels and it's come, it covers sins of ignorance. And when we go through, I think I may even get to some of that in the lesson today, um, but for the sake of time, I might not hit everything, but uh, in part of the lesson today and that we're, we're going into, it lets you know that when a person does things ignorantly, his judgment is different than someone that does it presumptuously, but there's still a chastisement on each level. So the punishment for someone that ignorantly does something is lesser than the punishment or the chastisement for someone that greatly does something or knows better. So the chastisement or the repercussions of, of our actions comes based upon the level of our understanding. So the more we understand, the more we're held accountable for and the chastisement is greater, but chastisement comes on those in ignorance as well as those who knowingly does certain things. Um, did that help at all, sister, with where you were going with your question? Um, yes, yes, because I was reading on my own study last night. That's why I brought it up. Mm -hmm. And it was saying, blessed is who you're who are reproved because who you reprove you love. Right. And yeah, and I was saying that, okay, we should stop getting reproved while we can't just walk in obedience and stuff. So I was wondering if it's ignorantly sin you reprove us for. So that's why yeah. I asked the question. Okay. Yeah, that was a good question. And um, um and also is a good question. I'm glad that you asked it because like I say, again, uh, people are a lot of times when they're going through chastisement, they call it spiritual warfare and they turn on the most high, not understanding that it is still a blessing that you got the chastisement. That is the love of the most high. So when you thought you was going through spiritually, when he started chastising you and taking you through things, he got your attention. And then when your attention was uh, was grabbed by the most high, you're like, why am I going through this? You start seeking out of the word. You start seeing what you was doing wrong. Then you can now say, oh, this is mercy. This is the mercy and the love of the most high. He loved me. Therefore, he chastised me. Whereas in others, as I said in that lesson, also with spiritual warfare, to try to get the volume of where I was trying to go with the, the, the spectrum of the scope of that lesson. There, there are many that don't even know they're in spiritual warfare. And, and I started off with that. And the reason why they don't know, because they just live in their life. They're not going through anything. They have their riches. They have their home. It seems like everything is good in life. Oh, I'm getting the promotion. I'm getting a new house. I'm getting all these things. They have no idea they're in spiritual warfare. So they just live in their life not knowing they're in spiritual warfare because the Most High has pretty much abandoned them but at, at the moment don't want them. And he's letting the adversary just take them on their journey. Whereas in with some people first start getting chastised, want to know, well, I'm trying to live right, and they're not doing this. Why am I going through this? It's because the Most High loves you. And so once you understand these things, then you understand that, wow, his chastisement is mercy. Because what's going to come to that person that's been in that sin for a very long time is going to be a much greater punishment, a sore punishment to them when their time comes. Whereas in the Most High is checking some of us early on, that is actually the mercy of the Most High. You know, so uh, thank you for asking that, uh, that question. 
Um, I, can't, I, can't, I, I see Shy has his hand up, but I did because I was getting on late. I wasn't fully set up when y'all started, and I had a couple to go back to. Did you want to give Shy opportunity, or did you want to? Um, was that the last question you was taking? Um, well, we're getting close to that time, or if you if you don't mind the time, we can we can take Shy Shamar and actually we'll let you address it, and then we'll go with Shy Shamar. Okay, so uh, Shy, if we have time, let me try to go back through some of the other ones real quick. Um, so uh, just for a reference point, um, first of all, uh, there was a Godal edification that Zakane gave in regards to fasting on Shabbat. But our uh, T. Rose, just for a reference point for yourself, if you like to reference and just study on it for yourself, if you go to the book of Jubilees, the 50th chapter, um, the 50th chapter, I'll start reading it. It says, uh, I'm starting with one. It says, and after this Torah, I made known to you the days of the Shabbat in the desert of Sinai, which is between Elam and Sinai. And I told you of the Shabbat of the land on Mount Sinai, and I told you of the Jubilee years and the Shabbat of years, but the year thereof have I not told you. So it's letting you know he's establishing the Sabbath to the people. And the land also shall guard its Sabbath or Shabbat while they dwell upon it, and they shall know the Jubilee years. So in the book of Jubilee, it's basically letting us know all the different Sabbaths, the Sabbath of years, the Sabbath of Jubilees, uh, and the, the, the yearly or the annual rest that the uh, land is supposed to have. It says, wherefore I have ordained for you the year of weeks and years and jubilees so i'm not going to read all of this so i'm going to just drop down now to seven it says six days shall labor be done but on the seventh day is the sabbath unto yah your elohim or Elohe your elohim in it you shall do no matter of work you know your sons know your daughters and the man that does any work so it's going into pretty much what you've already read in torah but the explanation that elder gave when he went to uh the book of shemot and he was explaining that there's also another commandment that comes with it and what the Shabbat was actually for. The Shabbat wasn't a day of affliction. The Shabbat was a day of actually rest. It was a day to actually cease from afflictions and cease from certain type things in its, in its, in its, uh, in its creation from the very beginning. All right. And so it says, uh, verse nine, ye shall do, uh, do no work whatsoever on Sabbath, except what ye have prepared for yourselves on the sixth day. So as to eat, and drink and rest and guard the Sabbath from all work on that day and to bless Yahuwah who has uh, given you a day of feast and a holy day. So again, there's certain like the day of atonement is not actually a cog. A cog is a feast day, a feast when you come together to eat, uh, to eat certain things. So even though it's called a Shabbat also, it has its own ordinance. So you observe it like a Shabbat with the exception it has a different ordinance. So the ordinance of a Shabbat is to feast and to have a meal preparation and to rest and to cease from everything on atonement a yom kippur is to cease from work do no labors but you also have to cease from the ordinance on that particular shabbat is not to eat anything so you fast so uh moving on it says um and 10 for great is the honor which yah has given to yisrael that they should eat and drink and be satisfied on his feast day and rest thereon from all labor which belongs to the labor of the children of men except burning frankincense and bringing oblations and sacrifice before Yah for days and for the Sabbath. So there are certain sacrifices and things going to be brought. So the only work that can be done is bringing forth the sacrifices, the oblations and things. But he said, this day has been given as a barakah or a blessing to the children of Israel for feasting, for eating, and for enjoying that day. That is a day of pretty much relief and enjoyment, like a day of salvation. Just It's like a, a pre- view of what salvation is supposed to be like. Like, oh, you know, that's my rest. Um, 11 it says this work alone shall be done on the sabbath in uh, the sabbath in the sanctuary yahuwah elohim that they may atone for yisrael with sacrifice continued from day to day for memorial well pleasing before yah okay i'm gonna drop down it says uh and every man who does any work thereon or goes on a journey or tills his farm whether in his house or any other place and whomsoever lights a fire or rides on any beast or travels by ship on the sea and whosoever strikes or kills anything or slaughters a beast or bird or whosoever catches an animal or a bird or a fish or whosoever fast or makes war on the Sabbath. That man who does any of these things on the Sabbath shall die so that the children of Israel shall observe the Shabbat or the Sabbath according to the commandments regarding the Sabbath of the land. So basically you will be slaughtering. So when we see he gave a d distinction. So there are slaughterings that can take place in the temple for the oblations, but anybody doing that on their own land should be killed because we shouldn't be killing animals to prepare on Shabbat because there's a preparation time. We should already prepare our meal for Shabbat, but it also comes and it gives you several things that you should not do on the Sabbath, and fasting was one of them. 
you know, um, so fasting was one, and here's one of the references that actually goes into the historical recording saying fasting is something that is not recommended to be done on Shabbat. Um, so here's a reference point where you get that. So when Zakane explained from the Torah perspective, it pretty much lined up with this here because it's telling you about the preparation and, and the foods and the preparation of the meal and things to be done on Sabbath. Um, and so Ima Shoshana actually was, gave a part of the answer that I was going to give also, because then you have uh, many, you know, because that's what we do. Like when we're seeing things, there's certain things that sound like it contradicts other things, such as we know it said Moshe fasted 40 days and 40 nights. We know that Yahusha fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And as I was, Zakin, um Yaquab already said, it could be possible that you can fast on Shabbat, you know, but he went just by what he understood by the commandments of, and that's what I'm going by now. So when you look at the extreme circumstances, Yahusha um, was, was sent by the Most High in the fullness of the Ruach of the Most High. So he was different than pretty much any of us. And, um, and he had a, a call on his life to do a certain thing. Um, and when you look at, uh, and, and he was in the presence of the Most High when he went to do his fast. When Moshe did that 40 day, 40 night fast, Moshe was not on the earth doing a 40 day, 40 night fast. He was in the presence of the creator himself. Therefore, 40 days and 40 nights, who needs anything when you're in the presence of Yah, direct presence of Yah, called up to the Mount of Yah, Yah speaking directly to you. There's no time to eat. I'm feeding you this word and I'm sustaining you as you hear. But in the natural sense of us and our bodies and the natural man, you know, um, there may be even a rest from fasting. So if we want to fast and we say we want to do a weekly fast and we're going to go no food, no, no water, then the Shabbat may be a rest even to break fast. And you can come back and start your fast again after you uh, after you now do. Yes, but Zion said he had the best food, the word of Yah and Yah himself. So um, so you break, you can break it on Shabbat, um, break your fast on Shabbat, and you can always come right back. So it's still giving you time for your body to get whatever it needs on Shabbat and to have the Shabbat as a delight. Um, and I know, and I'm not saying this about you, I'm saying it about all of us because I've been there. Because we know that Shabbat is a high day. Many times, a lot of us feel like, well, that's the Sabbath, so I really want to show my dedication to the Most High. I want to fast on Shabbat. And so there's, uh, and when you go to the Brit Kaddish, when it says they've gone about to establish their own righteousness, but have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of the Most High, a lot of us have created things that we do because we know that it's supposed to be a form of righteousness, but doing it out of, out of order cannot be as righteous as we think it is. And I learned the hard way before I knew that I wasn't supposed to fast on Shabbat, before I fully had that understanding of not fasting on Shabbat, and I've not even read this script yet myself, you know, I was under the mindset, like, I'm really going to dedicate myself to the Most High on Sabbath. I'm going to fast on Sabbath. And it was this one Shabbat, you know, I'm, I'm fasting and I'm up and I'm giving the lesson and, you know, everything's going fine. But as I'm bringing forth the lesson and I'm, I'm on my fast, you know, so I'm fasting, I'm, my fast is now carrying over into Shabbat. I'm up and I'm teaching a lesson teaching a lesson and I feel the dizziness coming on. I feel the wooziness and I feel like I want to pass out and it's coming on. I bring forth the word of the most high. And at the end, when I open the floor for the elders to make their comments, the elders are making their comments and I'm doing everything I can to stay, stay on my feet. And I'm like, and, and for the first time I was like, I wish they would hurry up. I hope nobody else has anything to say. And that day everyone has, has something to say, you know, and so the elders were doing a normal thing, but I was just like, I hope they will hurry up so I can sit, just sit down because I'm about to pass out. So I felt the affliction within my body. And so at that moment, the Shabbat for me was not as joyous as it should be because now the fellowship that you have afterwards, everyone else is breaking bread and eating. I'm still in a point of trying to fast at a time when I'm about to pass out. And this is pretty much lost all my being. And then also what I had to put out by bringing forth the word, that is a form of work. I, like I tell you right now, and I, I tell my Isha all the time, I don't know what it is, but after I finish on Shabbat, I'm hungry than any other day. Shabbat is the day I'm the hungriest. Like I'm hungry after Shabbat, but I can go to work and do my regular work and everything. And dinner can just be whatever dinner is. You know, I'm fine with that. But after Shabbat and after I bring forth the word, I'm starving for whatever that reason is, you know. So um, that's just a personal uh, share uh, from my experience of me thinking I was being uh, being righteous on Shabbat. So I'm just going to go what the text says. But to anyone, you can also pray to the Most High and ask because you will have naysayers that will say, not saying you, but I'm going to say there's some that will not even subscribe to the Book of Jubilee, so they're going to say they, they don't believe that portion. But what I'm saying is from what he showed me from my experience, and this is what's written here and what Zakain already edified, you know, I would say that if you're going to fast, I would fast during the week. I would, I would, I would cease my fast on Shabbat and pick it back up during the week because that fast for Moshe 40 days, 40 nights, the Most High called him up. 
Yahusha, he was up with the father also in his prayer and meditation. And he was a very special one because he had the fullness of the Ruach of the Most High and the power of Yah was upon him. So though we want to do these things, my suggestion would be um, that you, if you want to do a, a fast, hey, do a six day fast, but rest on the Shabbat. And if you want to carry on with your fast, do your fast, but rest on Shabbat. Now, if it's um, uh, like a Daniel fast or any of the fast where you're still consuming food, you can do that fast on the Shabbat because it's not, it's not commanded that you have to have meat on Shabbat. So if you are still eating and drinking water on it, like for us to Daniel fast, fruits and vegetables, you know what I'm saying? If a person is doing a Daniel fast, and like I say, some of us have already started trying to do certain purges that we're doing, leading up to atonement, preparing ourselves for this, and just wanting to get certain things out of our system, then, you know, it's nothing wrong with that fast on Shabbat because you still will be eating vegetables and fruit and drinking water. But as far as the full, no no water, no, uh, no water, no, um, no drink on Shabbat, you know, um, I would I would lean more toward the side of caution as what it says here. And because we see the commandments and it is a cog, it is a feast day, whereas an atonement is specifically a fast day for affliction of soul. And Zakane did an uh, outstanding um, edification. So, Koti, I hope that helps in regards um, in regards to uh, your question. Um, and in regards to uh, Adon Uziel's question, uh, Uziel was question was is he still online? I can't see who's on. Um, Cause I don't want to go into it if he's offline. Is he still online? I can't see all the names. Hey, oh, okay. hey, he's, still, he's still on, more. Okay, and what what exactly was it, uh, was your point to your question, Uziel, about the uh, the the water? If if you could, I was okay, and I was trying to see what exactly is the water of purification. Is it something that was fetched outside of the camp to purify? Um, the persons who dealt with the bodies and the ashes of the red heifer and the blood, or, you know, was it something that the priest had, you know, stored away somewhere, you know? Okay. So, uh, the water was, uh, was a water that was actually going to be actually prepared by the priest. Um, so when we go back into, uh, by me, by numbers chapter 19, um, it says, and y'all spoke to Moshe and to Aharon saying, this is the Torah, which Yah has commanded saying, speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer a perfect one in which there is no blemish and on which a yoke has never come. So right now, if anyone knows about red heifers, red heifers were very important to the priesthood and to the land of Israel. And so um, if anybody has been paying attention to what's going on, they're saying that they've seen a red heifer in Israel or something like that, which they have not seen in many years. So whole nother topic for a whole nother time. But I just want, I just want to go there for a specific reason because red heifers were very key and prominent in Israel for because they had a purpose. Um, it says, and you shall give to Eleazar the priest, and he shall bring it outside the camp and shall slay it before him. And Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood seven times toward the front of the tent of appointment. And the heifer shall be burnt before his eyes. He burns it, its hide, its flesh, and its blood, and its dung. And so I know we're not supposed to eat blood, we don't supposed to drink blood, but we also see that. Uh, atonement for sins and things like that blood is always something that's used so purging from sin or covering or blotting out someone's sin a lot of times blood is acting kind of like a, a cleanser you know what i'm saying even though we know blood is unclean for us to eat and to touch so on and so forth but it's also used uh uh, uh ceremonially as a cleanser uh, it has cleansing properties to cleanse or purge or blot out sin all right so um so you're taking this blood and you sprinkle it seven times it says in the priest shall take the cedar wood of his sop um, and the scarlet and throw them into the midst of the fire burning the heifer the priest shall then wash his garments and shall bathe his body in water and afterward come into the camp but the priest is unclean until even and he who is burning it washes his garments in water and shall be uh, and shall bathe his body in the water it is unclean until evening and a clean man shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and shall place them outside the camp in a clean place and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water for uncleanliness. It is uh, for the cleansing from sin. So the, these, this red heifer is going to be what actually is going to be used to actually be an ingredient for this water purification. And also um, the water purification. Also, when you see that each priest that had something to do with this process became unclean so they themselves also had to cleanse themselves and wash and bathe themselves and then after one did one thing the other one came and now took the ashes that after the first priest did his portion and now he became unclean now someone else comes in and gets the ashes takes the ashes to a set apart place 
So this red heifer is going to be a part of what is going to be um, actually uh, making um, the uh, that that water. So it's it's still based upon the priesthood. Yes, a uh, came to an extent to an extent, but it's not that the water itself had to be going and get got from some special place. It's what the actual uh, actually got. Quite as about I didn't understand where you're coming from. So um, it's not just that the water had to be get, got from some special place, but uh, that the priests themselves would, would have to be the ones, the process, the ceremony of them and what they're going through is going to be this water and how this water is coming about. And also you see that this water is going to be a water that's for purification, but it also is a water that, you know, that in the process of it becoming this water, it's also uncleanness. So you can't be, it makes you unclean as well. So I hope that's just a quick, like, as I can't say, a quick, uh, quick response so and and some of the stuff again is based upon the priesthood at that time in the red heifer and they're saying that they've seen a red heifer in israel i don't know i haven't seen it myself but they're saying that they, they've seen a red heifer in israel that's what some of the reports are so again the red heifer was a part of uh, of this water or, or the process of this water being done here um is, did that help at all adon uh, Moray and uh, told I would buy. I'm gonna look at those references he put. I'll okay, I'll pray. I'll pray to the Most High. And like I can't say, we don't know all of it. So there's some parts of the Torah we don't fully understand ourselves and the exacts of how some of the stuff done, or, or some we can start seeing some of the application or what was being done. But right now, we don't even have the ability ourselves to actually, you know do this actual thing to the way that the priest was doing it we're not the levites we're not the sons of Eharon, and we don't have red heifers to to do certain things at this moment um real quick i know we're to the 130 mark but Bassion, i didn't even hear your question i heard them speaking about it um could you uh share with me what your question was real quick just so i can hear what your question was Bassion, earlier Kane, um, the question was about how to understand what our culture looked like anciently, whether or not we should go with um, those neighboring uh, cultures like um, ancient Acadia, Sumeria, the Mesopotamians, which were mm -hmm. closer in culture, mm -hmm. um, or what to do. And the answer I received was we need to focus on Torah, and mm -hmm. that was sufficient enough for me. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. Um, so, yes, we should uh, focus on Torah because Torah is our culture. But um, to the second part of your question and what you said, so definitely modernly today in, in the culture that we're in, we don't need to be focusing and trying to get nothing from America to tell us about our culture. But there are certain things that, though we may not want to hear it on this call, there are certain things that cultures that's in, in the land that was there, even though some of them have some wickedness, they still have some righteousness in it also. Some of them still have Torah practices in their culture. You know, for, first of all, the way cultures honor and respect marriage, uh, that was that was highly respected in, in a lot of cultures. You know what I'm saying? Um, some of the cultures, when you look at it, Abraham had more than just Isaac, okay? Abraham had sons that produced other nations. For example, um, when you look at Moshe, and you read in the Torah itself about Moshe submitting to Jethro, who gave him, um gave him wisdom on how to actually govern the people who told him the way that he was going about it was going to wear him out you're doing it the wrong way it said that moshe did uh obeyance unto his father-in-law who was a midianite who basically as i came covered last week was a relative so to speak he was a cousin nation because he was still seed of abraham he was not an israelite but he was still seed of Abraham. And so even Moshe, knowing Torah, still yielded to the wisdom that came forth from someone that was in leadership already who still had certain principles of, of, of how to govern and how to be an authority. So if it comes back to Torah, if it lines up with Torah, then so be it. For example, I, I, and I hate when I have to do this, and I'm just sharing this with some Maureen just this week. Christians have structure in their organizations. It's not all right, but at least they have a structure. Jewish people have a structure. It's not all right, but at least they have a structure. Muslims have a structure. It's not all right, but at least they have a structure. So also Islam, which means they're the ones that submitted to the will of Allah. They say they, a Muslim is one who submits to the will of Allah, meaning so already culturally, outside of what we do in America, they believe that you submit to the will of the Most High, which is Allah, right? 
So that's what they believe. They are seed of Abraham. They're more closely related than a Midianite because they are Ishmaelites. So Ishmaelites were still following the traditions and customs of Abraham because Abraham was their father also. They just found their way away from it. And Abraham told all his children, when you read in the book of, uh, I believe, the Jubilees of Jasher, um, and I won't go there today, but for your own, because I know you'll research it out. You're going to see where uh, Abraham told all his children before he passed, keep the Torah of Yah, which will make up some of those nations that you mentioned. So some of those nations that you mentioned will be seed of Abraham also. So some of their traditions, some of their customs, some of their culture. If you look at Muslim garb and you look at our garb, a lot of times Muslim garb and our garments look exactly alike. The difference is do as I can not say, but we do Torah. We put fringes on our garments. They don't. But when you actually look at how they dress, a lot of times their dress is the same as ours because they are closely related and they're a seed of Abraham also. So their mannerisms, their respect towards the creator, they have more respect to the creator than a lot of us in the Hebrew community. They have a discipline in their walk more than we in the Hebrew community. All we're doing is debating and talking about and judging everybody. Some of them Christians have more of a discipline than a lot of us also. So what actually, as I can't say, lines up with Torah, that's what we always go by. But then once you see certain customs of, of those that's around, if it lines up with Torah and you're not doing it, but then Torah says do something and you see that what they're doing lines up with Torah and you see how they're doing it, it's, that's not necessarily a negative. But as I can't say, but our rule of thumb is it all has to be Torah. But uh, as me and the Maureen was talking, there's certain things that we're knocking because Torah does not always explain everything plain text. That's why there's a need for griots or storytellers. There's a need for elders of Zakanim, for the elders of the older people. As Elder Herman says, you take something 50 years, people still going to know about it. But you take something 100 years, it's going to be forgotten. Because if you don't have anyone to still teach the younger generation, some of the stuff we're reading, like Uziel just asked the question, we can't fully explain that uh, the waters there because we weren't there. So we can only go by what we can see in the text and what it says if this is done, then this makes you unclean. That's to the scope of my understanding of the, of that word of purification. You know what I'm saying? But when you have someone that was traditionally living by culture and passing it down, they will have a more clear understanding of how it was done, whereas we're learning our way back. So for safety, and this is what we're going to always say, Torah trumps all. Torah trumps all. But there are many nations that are in, of the East Country that have not been Romanized have not been Western mindsetized, such as right now. A lot of those countries over there, they're not having that sodomy and Gomorrah stuff. You know what I'm saying? But America is, but they're not because they understand that the Most High doesn't want that. So that's something that even our country is not following. That some of those other uh, other people are, and some of those are our kindred. So the short and uh, the response up, the rule on the side of caution and safety. Torah is always what we do. And when Zakane, I heard part of Zakane's response. Definitely this modern um, this modern way that people is telling us how to raise children, how to live our lives, and so on and so forth. We definitely don't want to lean to their understanding. But when, but the last portion that you say about Acadians and things like that, when you go back to some, some of their ways were barbaric, you know what I'm saying? But some of their ways still did line up with Torah because what we don't really see um, back in times past, it wasn't like today, a whole lot of atheists. I hate to say it from when you read in the text, you see that everyone did believe in a higher power. But the atheists, they say they don't believe in nothing. They don't believe in no God. But at least when you're reading through the Torah and Tanakh, these people did believe. And even when they went through uh, went through uh, uh, Mitraim and uh, Abraham told them, hey, say that you're my sister. He was like, man, why you do this? You should have told me that was your wife because even they knew that was wrong. So Torah first, but there are certain cultures and certain things that they're doing, such as some people already know how to observe time better than we do because they, they were raised up in the East. They were raised up doing things that's already written in Torah. Uh, there's things that even, and I hate to say it, but I have to be clear with what I said. There's certain things that sometimes the Jewish people may have more clarity on than us because they hide in our records, as is the Roman Catholic Church. They're hiding our records. And so they know who our cousins and our kindred is and what they were doing. And they try to keep a lot of them suppressed from out of the media so that we don't even see that there's people that are still doing things that's written in Torah that don't fully know the Torah themselves based upon the era they came up in and the nation they came up in that was closer to the most high than this nation that we were part of in America. So I hope that helped as well. But as I can't say, Torah, Torah, Torah is what we go to. But there are some things culturally that other nations um, do that actually uh, does line up with Torah and the Mashiach 
see God. Paul himself even speaks about when the Gentiles do naturally the things that's written into Torah is a law unto themselves. So there are people that does not know Torah, has not been taught Torah, is not Israel, that are going to Gentiles that are naturally doing things that's in Torah just because there were certain things that in the earth was kind of like universal. Some some things is in Torah was universal to some nations and tribes and to this wickedness that we come into is just taking us really far beyond um, the level of imagination. I hope that helped a little bit, uh, Akoti. Um, was there? Kane, told Amore. Was there anything else, I Kane? That, that, that was it. Uh, that, that's pretty much all the uh, the scope of the questions, uh, Amore. And I seen Bazion put in a message. She liked this format. So, um, real quick, I know some people didn't ask questions, um, but for those who did, and for those even if you didn't ask questions. Do y'all like this format uh, periodically that we take a break and do this? Just give us consensus real quick. How did y'all like us having this portion this way today? Always willing to roll. Sabah. Hallelujah. All right. So, Zakane, uh, uh, you was led by the Ruach. Zakane, I believe uh, the room uh, enjoyed this portion. You know, and so uh, we will periodically uh, take breaks and do the Q and A segment for the coaching study. Told uh, 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 Zakane, Yaquab, Zakane, Eliyahu, uh, for y'all hosting this portion. Hello, yeah, hello, yeah. And then we, again, we still we we do have that six thirty. So if you didn't get your question in um, when we come back on at six thirty, you know, you, you can you can bring your question up then too. Hallelujah. Yep. Shah Shamar, you, you, you first want to question uh, Shah Shamar when we come back. Hallelujah. All praise, honor, and esteem to the Most High. Uh, I yield. Hallelujah. I told us I came, told a great portion today. We now yield the floor to Don Kanakia for his two minute 